Fascinating rhythm, you got me on the go. Fascinating rhythm, I'm all a quiver. The fascinating Paul Boskind. Everybody here should have a magazine. That's what it says on the front cover of this month's Irish America magazine. The fascinating Paul Boskind. Well, I'm not exactly comfortable with that descriptor. <laughs> Just not, guys. It was two and a half years ago that I took the 23andMe genetic testing, and I did not know that I was Irish, as Kieran just announced. Boskind is a good German-Dutch name. But no, I'm Irish. I am predominantly Irish, vast majority Irish. So when you discover that you're Irish, what do you do? You go to Ireland. So I found myself checking into the Fitzwilliam Hotel across from St. Stephen's Green, right there in downtown Dublin. And when I checked in, the desk clerk said, oh, heads up, it's going to be a little crazy here tomorrow. We have a big parade. And I said, what's the nature of the parade? And he said, it's the gay pride parade. <laughs> I had a big smile, thumbs up, and I said, that's A-OK -okay with me. So I ended up the next morning watching the parade, and I went to the end of the parade route where the speakers were giving their speeches. Whoa, the openly gay Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, Leo Varadkar, was speaking to the crowd. He was speaking to me. Now, I already knew that Ireland was progressive, and they had passed marriage equality by referendum. But this combination of listening to him speak knowing they had marriage equality. I was so proud, I was so pleased to be Irish. I had found my homeland. I really, really had. This is incredible. So when you go to Ireland, you see castles that are open to the public. You can stay in castles that have been converted to boutique hotels. And if you're Paul Boskind, you buy a castle. So I'm the proud owner of Clombrock Castle in County Galway. It sits on 30 acres. It has a number of habitable properties in terms of cottages and a turret that's been converted and a gardener's house. And that's what I liked about it because my big mission was to convert and renovate this six-story tower house. And that's what I've been working on since February of 2018 when I closed on the property. And I've been going out there every month for eight, 10, and 12 days overseeing the construction and the renovation. I love projects. I love creative outlets. I am in my element hanging out in Ireland doing this. I, um, I, I'm just so thrilled to be Irish. I'm thrilled to be hanging out in Ireland. And I couldn't think of a better place to be. Although I do have another life. When my good friend and travel partner, James Kelly, who works for me full time, he introduced me to Patricia Hardy, who we've all met as the organizer of this event. He let me know that she, ha she had a niece that was recently diagnosed with Stargardt's disease. That is the retinal eye disorder that I have. It means that I have central vision loss, and when I look out at you guys, I can't see any detail in this area. It's obscured, it's blurry, I can't see faces. What is really cool about, hmm, I can't see faces, is those VIPs over there, those visually impaired people who are part of my Stargard support group, they also say, yeah, Paul, I get it. We can't see faces either. It really feels good to know I'm not alone. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs> At the age of 21, I knew something was wrong with my eyes. I was having trouble reading the phone book. In microbiology lab, I was looking in the microscope and I couldn't see what other people were seeing in their microscopes. So I went to an ophthalmologist, and he referred me to a retinal specialist. And then I found myself in what they called grand rounds at the local university hospital. 
I had a dozen ophthalmologists parade in and look in my eyes and ask me questions, and then they all left the room and I'm there alone. And they went to confer, like, what do we think's going on with his eyes? The lead ophthalmologist came back in and said, we figured it out. We know what's going on. And I said, great, what? He said, you have Stargardt's disease. That explains why you're having trouble seeing. It starts with the central vision. It will progress. The cells in the center of your retina, in the back of your eye, they're dying off. They're deteriorating. And more of them will die off. Then it's going to spread to the peripheral vision. And you're going to go blind. Blind. I said, you mean like blind, blind? Like black, like I can't see anything, like pitch dark? And he said, yes. Whew. I said, so what do, what do I do then? And he said, well, I, it, it depends on when this is going to happen. And I said, yeah, and when is this going to happen? And he says, we don't really know. It's different for everybody else. But you'll be the first to know. <sighs> I'll tell you what I did then. I got my act together. I had been floundering in undergrad. I had changed my major seven times. I had changed from three different universities. Truth be known, I was likely running from my own sexual orientation. That's a tough thing. What I ended up doing was in one semester, I got 30 hours worth of credit. I graduated the following summer session. And I graduated, interestingly enough, with a GPA of 2.02. <laughs> You're required to have a minimum of a 2.0. Now, when I, was, when I was in college, I had to work. Uh, my family was not in a position to help me out with these things. And actually, that was kind of the way it was throughout high school. I was a good paper boy uh, all throughout high school. And I earned my own money to buy a car and buy my clothes and to save for college. And then when I was in college, I also had to work. And I, I learned that having a sales commission job was far better than an hourly rate, because you could make more money. So I did things like I sold encyclopedias door to door. In college, I sold Bibles door to door in the summers. And I made enough money to be able to get myself out of the dorm. And I bought a mobile home, my very first home. I, I worked hard. I studied hard. I became a very serious, stellar student. And I got accepted to a master's program in clinical psychology in San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from. And then I got accepted to Hofstra University right in the New York City area for my doctorate in clinical and school psychology. I'm a psychologist, guys. Uh, it, it reminds me of when I first met Patricia Hardy, and she told me about her niece with Stargardt's disease. She told me about her aunt who had macular degeneration, which is also central vision loss. And then she sighed. I can't see her face as we're sitting on my couch. But I leaned in and asked Patricia, are you concerned that you're going blind too? And she said, yes, yes, I am. I have a tendency, some people over there know, to be very candid, to be direct, and at times to be confrontational. But as a psychologist, I connect the dots to what people are saying, and I make more meaning out of that. But it, it, it gives me an opportunity to connect in a more meaningful and more intimate way. It's just kind of part, I, part of who I am, and that's how I function. So watch out, guys. Afterwards, we can chat, right? Why not? So I, I get my doctorate from Hofstra University. I move back to Texas. And I worked for a large medical practice. And I honed my clinical skills in their behavioral health specialty. And I'm a pretty damn good clinician. And I decided, I can go into private practice. Let's do it. So I did it the Paul Boskin way. I bought a building at the Deer Oaks office park. And I named the practice Deer Oaks Mental Health Associates. I knew, I knew it was going to be bigger than just me. 
when in fact that is exactly what has happened. The psychology practice now, we expect to do next year $50 million in annual revenue. I will have approximately 700 employees. And I took the big risk early on, knowing that I had so many patients that I didn't know how to handle them all. I needed some assistance. I needed some help. So I hired a full-time psychologist. They were my employee. And I, can I keep them busy? Well, they kept busy. And then I hired another one the next month and another one the subsequent month. And now we're up to, as I said, some 700 plus employees. That's a business success in my mind. What do you think? So I am now CEO, executive chairman. I have a wonderful senior management team that affords me the opportunity to do other fun and interesting things in my life, having projects and creative outlets, which is kind of a requirement for me. It always has been. So after I had finished renovating a Victorian historic home in downtown San Antonio, two blocks away, there was a dinner theater. And I decided to buy it. I need another project, creative outlet. I knew about the restaurant business because I had worked with a builder after I had designed this lake house outside of San Antonio, and I liked working with him. Then I bought a property on the other side of the lake, and I said, let's build a restaurant. So we built a very successful res restaurant with special event facility, and then I turned two other spaces in San Antonio into special event facilities, and I'm in the business of doing this about the whole time managing and overseeing this growing psychology practice, which I'm able to do because in my life I've always had an incredible sense of urgency. I've been running from, running toward, don't lose your vision, your, your, your eyesight's gonna go, you were told you're gonna go blind, you better hurry, get a move on, get a move on. Well, the whole practice has that very ambitious, let's get going mentality because it's infectious. So Deer Oaks is incredibly successful. I have um, always done other extracurricular activities, if you will, in terms of other businesses. It's, it's in part because, because it's in my DNA, just like being Irish is in my DNA, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. One of the things that I did is I bought this dinner theater and decided I wanted to learn about producing theater in San Antonio. And it went really well for three plus years. And then I got picketed. I had the evangelicals, the Bible thumpers with their signs talking about how awful it would be to come see this show. It was a gay themed show called Southern Baptist Sissies. Yeah. At that point, I knew exactly what I want to do. I want to produce gay-themed theater that will impact audiences on pro-equality issues and also entertain them at the same time. Why not, right? But I certainly didn't want to do it in conservative San Antonio, Texas. So what do I do? I bought a condominium, a pied-a-terre, in the theater district here in New York City so I could come to New York and learn about becoming a Broadway theater producer. I think Kieran already spilled the beans. I have one of those things called a Tony Award. I'm a Tony Award winning Broadway producer. Whoa, who knew? Doing gay themed shows was not the beginning of my gay rights advocacy. I had worked with Service Members Legal Defense Network in San Antonio, and its sole mission was to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I was so proud to, to be there when President Obama signed it into law, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I also got involved with the Equality Texas state organization, and I was building bridges between these organizations, these national organizations that were fighting with other national organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, saying this is our area of expertise. But if you're on multiple boards, they all behave a whole lot better when you're at the board meeting, knowing that you wear these multiple hats. Then HRC, the, the country's largest LGBTQ advocacy organization, we went global. 
we went beyond just the borders of the United States and decided we're going we're to expand equality all around the globe. And then I got involved with the National Democratic Institute, which is, whew, it's chaired by Secretary Madeleine Albright. She is one heck of a powerhouse. Amazing. So then I'm meeting politicians, and I'm meeting congressional candidates. And I get involved with the Democratic National Committee. Thank you, Andy. Andy Tobias is here as my friend, treasurer of the DNC for umpteen years. Andy had little idea when he invited me to this event that I was going to get so pulled in. And I'm now serving on the National Finance Committee of the DNC. I'm also the national co-chair of the LGBTQ Council. And that means I'm committed. I'm committed to raising money for the DNC. I'm also committed to electing the next Democratic President of the United States. Yeah, yeah, baby. We want that. Life is good. I have my struggles still. The vision was stable. I was still legally blind. I still used low vision aids. But in the last three plus years, my vision has fallen off the cliff. And I've brought out the blind boy cane that I very affectionately call it. I didn't have much affection towards that cane initially. But I can't go anywhere without it these days. I live in the Times Square area, and I need them to know that as I'm heading down the sidewalk, they have to get out of my way, because I can't see them. I honestly can't tell the people coming. Struggles, strife, challenges. Every one of you, every one of you in this room, you also have your own struggles. Think about it. You know what I mean. Fascinating rhythm. You got me on the go. And we're all going to keep going, aren't we? We're going to keep going together. Thank you very much.